Well, good evening. I'm coming at you live this week for our study. Uh, most weeks on Wednesdays I've been recording this, but uh, recording it and then broadcasting it recorded later, but uh, this is live and you may be watching it live or recorded. That's your choice. Uh, but good to be with you for our midweek study. Have you ever been called a wise guy or referred to somebody as a wise guy? Now, if I begin our look at some Proverbs tonight by reading, for instance, chapter 25, verse 24, it's better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Or if I went over chapter 27, verses 15 and 16, and read a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike, to restrain her is to restrain the wind or to grasp oil in one's right hand. If I were to start that way, which I'm not, I might be called a wise guy by uh, a redhead I know. Um, but we use that term sometimes to refer to people, um, I guess by, by wise guy, we mean a smart aleck or um, I looked up a definition because I wasn't sure exactly what it meant uh, other than a smart aleck. But uh, the definition that I saw was that a wise guy is somebody who thinks they're uh, above or smarter than, than everybody else. And, uh, you know, when we, when we open Proverbs, uh, that is not the, the picture of the wise person, the wise man, the wise guy. Uh, in biblical terms, it's certainly not an arrogant thing or a, a smart alecky kind of thing. Um, and and uh, hopefully we've seen that as we've studied through uh, because there is some uh, misunderstanding of what wisdom is and, and so forth. So we were, um, over the last couple of sessions, just looking at some highlights, some favorites of Proverbs, gonna just finish that up and look at the end of the book and make a connection with the teaching and the ministry of Jesus. And that will be our study for this week. And then um, plan next time to open another of the books in the wisdom uh, literature of the Old Testament. And that is the book of Ecclesiastes, which uh, is a fascinating book and uh, maybe not one you've studied very much, but I think it's worthy of our time. So we'll spend a little bit of time in that book as well in this quest for wisdom. Uh, but uh, continuing in chapter 25 uh, for the moment, and we're just gonna look at a, a few in these succeeding chapters here. Uh, chapter 25, verse 28 says, a man without self-control, now, sort of uh, being fun at the beginning, we, we picked out those two that sort of pick on quarrelsome wives, but really most of the Proverbs uh, speak as if it's, it's talking about uh, the, the behavior of men. So it does even itself out. But a man without self-control, chapter 25, verse 28, is like a city broken into and left without walls. So again, this is one that maybe requires a little bit of ex explanation because our cities aren't built this way anymore. You know, uh, in the ancient world, a city had to have walls. If it didn't have walls, it was um, defenseless. It was very vulnerable and it basically wasn't a city. It was, you know, a village or something like that. Uh, but here, a man without self-control is like a city left without walls or a city broken into. And so it sort of gives the image of what's it like for a person to have no self-control. Um, they really open themselves up uh, to vulnerability and, and not in a good sense uh, uh, to attack and that kind of thing. And so that's, that's one of the proverbs we've been trying to note some of these that you sort of have to understand the culture a bit to benefit from. Chapter 26, verse 1, the very next one, actually, in the collection, 
like snow in summer or rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Uh, and so you have these two things that would be uh, considered uh, totally out of place, snow and summer, especially in, in a Middle Eastern culture. Uh, you barely get snow in winter, but snow in summer or rain in harvest could be a very devastating thing in, in a totally agricultural world. Um, like either one of those things, so honor is not fitting for a fool. A fool, and again, a fool is not a dumb person, a stupid person. A fool is a person who refuses to learn and to listen to instruction. And so that type of person is not fitting for them to be honored is what seems to be the point of the proverb. Verse 17 of the same chapter, chapter 26, who, I just love this one because of the image. It's almost a humorous image. Whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a, pa a passing dog by the ears. Uh, and you sort of have to picture that and then then apply it to the point, but I, we all know for the most part uh, that you don't grab a dog, that's a strange dog that's going by by its ears uh, without risking some pain, right? Um, and, and that's the same type of thing for a person who gets involved in a fight that's really not their business, meddles in a quarrel not his own. Um, it's like one who who takes a passing dog by the ears. I just love the, the imagery there. Uh, verse, well, chapter 27, verse 14, just a couple more of these quick ones, highlights. Whoever blesses his neighbor, now listen to this, whoever blesses his neighbor, and I stop there and you think, that doesn't sound so bad, blessing a neighbor, but whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice, rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. Isn't that interesting? Uh, we might think uh, giving a blessing to someone is always a good thing, but what if you do it at four in the morning with a very loud voice? Uh, is your neighbor really going to consider that a blessing? Likely not. They're going to consider it a nuisance uh, and a curse. So everything has its appropriate time and place is, is one of the lessons of wisdom. And so I, I just, I've always appreciated uh, the teaching of that, that proverb. And then one more like this in chapter 29, verse 11. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. And we talked near the beginning about a lot of these proverbs, uh, these wisdom sayings, uh, praise the idea of the person who's willing to keep their mouth shut at times. Um, to not say everything that might leap into their mind. Here, it's a person who uh, holds back maybe some emotion that, that they're having, does not give, you know, a fool is the one who gives full vent to his spirit, says whatever's on his mind, and expresses it in, in full. Um, that's a fool, but a wise person holds it back in, in, in silence at times. Does that mean it's always 100% true uh, that you should do that? No, but remember we don't, in studying the Proverbs, uh, list all the possible exceptions. Uh, we take the truth for what it is and we realize that sometimes it's better to be quiet. And that's a common teaching throughout the wisdom books and especially in Proverbs. Now, when we get to chapter 30, things change a little bit and we're back to sort of a thematic approach instead of each verse being its own teaching unit. Now there are maybe a few verses grouped together addressing a theme. And um, I just want to note a few of these and, and point out a couple sections here. So. Chapter 30, um, if you look back on our outline we gave you way back when, um, it talks about who these are attributed to in the opening verse. We won't pay attention to that for now. Chapter 30, verse 4, 
the question I've got as, as we listen to this is, what does this sound like? Is there something else we've heard before that sounds like this? So verse four, who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Now I hope that, that uh, when you, you read over that verse, that a section of the wisdom lit that we've looked at leaps to mind. Um, because that is uh, something that sounds very much like what we saw in, in uh, the book of Job. Remember, when God shows up and speaks in the closing chapters of Job, he asks Job all these questions. Uh, have you seen this, Job? Have you done this? Are you able to do this, Job? This is something that uh, sounds very much like what God says to Job, and hopefully um, that you heard that echo as we read through it. Uh, another thing that we get in chapter 30 are several numerical sayings. Uh, remember, there are a lot of different kinds of sayings used in, in wisdom books. One of them is the numerical saying. And you have these in a group beginning about verse 15 and going through the end of the chapter. So several different numerical sayings. Uh, for instance, uh, Verse 15 starts with the leech. The leech has two daughters, give and give. Uh, won't go into all the details of, of that one, but you see how it's using numbers is, is the idea. The one I wanted to um, pay attention to is a little bit later in the chapter. Uh, one that we read earlier, I believe, when we were talking about the numerical sayings is down verses 24 through 28, uh, where... It, Four things on earth are, are small, but they are exceedingly wise. And then it goes through and lists those things, one of them being the ant. Um, the ant are people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. That's, that's an example of a numerical saying. We talked about that one earlier. Uh, but the one for, for this evening begins in verse 29. Uh, it's just a good example of these numerical sayings where, where he says, Three things are stately in their tread. That is, they're sort of impressive as they move. Three things are stately in their tread. Four are stately in their stride. The lion, which is mightiest among beasts and does not turn back before any. The strutting rooster, the he-goat, and a king whose army is with him. The, at interesting um, you have what three four animals listed the lion the strutting rooster the he goat and then at the end a human a king whose army is with him is stately in his tread uh, or stately in his stride this is just an example of of a numerical saying and you might wonder you know what's the great theological teaching in that uh, we might struggle to to um, to enumerate with that uh, it has meaning, but uh, maybe some of the other things are more meaningful. It's just uh, a bit of wisdom, you know. There are some big bits of wisdom and smaller bits of wisdom. And then chapter thirty-one, the closing chapter, is the premier wisdom poem in in uh, the book of Proverbs. Uh, we have a little introductory, uh, introductory section at the beginning of chapter 31. It goes down through verse 9, but then beginning at verse 10 and going through the end of the book, verses 10 through 31, you have the premier wisdom poem in Proverbs, uh, which you've probably heard, read many times. Uh, I imagine preachers have used it many times on Mother's Day or... I know I've used it and others have used it when uh, uh, a saintly woman has died and we're, we're honoring her memory at, at a memorial service, something like that. But this passage, a lot of times called the, um, the uh, 
excellent wife or the, the wise woman, beginning in verse 10. One of the neat things about this that we don't see in English is uh, this is a full acrostic in the original. So in the Hebrew language, beginning at verse 10, the first uh, word, the, first, the letter of the first word is the A in the Hebrew. It's Aleph. Uh, and then down through the ver verse 31, um, you have the A to Z. So it's almost as if the, the, the writer is giving you the A to Z of the worthy, wise woman. And uh, so it is a full acrostic. And uh, it's interesting how this has been used through history. I talked about some of the ways we use it, but uh, in Jewish tradition, think about this, guys, this text is recited by a husband to his wife on Sabbath evenings. So if you want to really surprise your wife some Saturday night, recite Proverbs 31, 10 through 31 to her from, by, from memory, uh, preferably. If you really want to impress her, recite it in Hebrew. Uh, but it that's a Jewish tradition. I don't know how closely it's followed uh, by, by Jewish folks today, but that's a tradition. Uh, another interesting thing about the text is, it is that in the Hebrew Bible, okay, so we, we read from the English Bible, and we from our childhood are taught uh, the order of the books, right, Genesis through Malachi and so forth. Uh, but the Hebrew Bible, the books are arranged differently. They're in a different order. And so sort of jettison the way you've memorized the order of the Old Testament for a minute. And in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew arrangement, right after Proverbs 31 closes, if you were to read the very next book that comes up in the Hebrew Bible, that book would be Ruth. So you would go from this great wisdom poem about the worthy woman right into the story of Ruth in the Hebrew Bible, which is a really fascinating order to me um, that, that it would be arranged that way. I think it was intentionally arranged that way. And then if you just read through that brief book of Ruth, just four chapters in Ruth, the very next book in the Hebrew Bible would be the Song of Solomon, which eventually we'll get to in our study, if the Lord wills. So you, you have Proverbs 31, the worthy woman, you have Ruth, and then you have the Song of Solomon. And the fascinating thing about this to me is that all three of those texts, worthy woman, Ruth, Song of Solomon, present very positive, powerful female characters. Um, you know, the worthy woman, Ruth, and then the woman that, that Solomon is dialoguing with in Song of Solomon. None of those would you describe as weak or unaccomplished or anything like that. And these are lined up back to back to back in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, these very capable, uh, not totally dependent upon male uh, characters, uh, which is... is may be surprising when we think about the way we often assume the Bible uh, speaks of women. Uh, we won't read through this, this particular text. I think it's pretty familiar, but uh, remember the way she's described this, this wise woman. Uh, she has this interesting relationship with her husband uh, and her family, her children, course, praise her. They rise up and call her blessed, as one translation says it. She not only works in the home, but she works outside of the home. She's a businesswoman. She's industrious. And so all the characterization, characterizations of the sluggard, that is the lazy person in, in Proverbs, certainly do not apply to this woman. Of course, that makes sense. She's wise. Um, and, you know, just a very uh, positive portrait of this uh, godly woman. And that sort of 
leads us into our last point. What is the key to her greatness? A couple of verses toward the end, verse 26, it says of her, she opens her mouth with, with wisdom. So she's wise. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. And then verse 30, it says of her, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And that's almost the, the last verse of the book of Proverbs. Who gets praised? A woman who fears the Lord. And, uh, and that's the secret to her success and the secret to her goodness. So Proverbs um, closes with this great poem and uh, worthy of a lot of reflection and study. Last thing I wanted us to do in our survey of Proverbs is just to, again, connect this with our Lord, um, with Jesus in particular and sort of the New Testament's relationship to wisdom. Um, the way we'll start to do that is to remind, remind us of a couple of verses in the book of Luke chapter 2. Uh, remember Luke starts out with the birth and the early days of Jesus. And in chapter 2 verse 40, as it's speaking of Jesus' development as a child, it says, and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. Sophia, remember in Greek, wisdom. And the favor of God was upon him. So he, was, he grew and was strong, filled with wisdom. And then verse 52 of that chapter, uh, the closing verse, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And remember earlier in Proverbs, we noted a verse that sounded very, very similar to that as it described a wise person. And we think that Luke is uh, reflecting um, the language of Proverbs. A little bit later in, in Luke, in chapter 11, let me get there. We have a exchange between Jesus and um, some of the, the teachers and the crowds um, this is the, the time that he compares himself to Jonah. Remember, uh, he said, you know, they were, they were asking for, for him to do signs. And, and he says, you're evil because your generation is evil because you seek a sign. No sign is going to be given you except the sign of Jonah. And he talks about how uh, Jonah was a sign to the people of Nineveh. So will the son of man be to this generation. And um, you might remember parts of that conversation, or maybe all of it. But verse 31 in particular, Jesus says, The Queen of the South, and you might remember in the Old Testament story, uh, the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon and was amazed at Solomon's wealth and wisdom and so forth. And that's who Jesus seems to be referring to here. He says, The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. I wanted us to, to, to hear those words that Jesus spoke because he makes a pretty bold claim here that only the son of God could make. That is, he is wiser than wisdom's fountainhead. Remember, we talked about Solomon being portrayed in the Old Testament as the wisest of the wise, at least in one part of his life, and that he's sort of the one from whom all wisdom springs uh, in the Old Testament, other than God. Uh, but Jesus says, you know, yes, Solomon was great, and people came great distances to, to uh, see him and to hear his wisdom, but something greater than Solomon is here. And he's referring to himself. Uh, I don't know if the crowd caught it when he said it, uh, but we're glad that Luke did and he recorded it for us. Jesus uses wisdom talk often in, in his teaching. That's one of the things I wanted us to, to note 
Uh, he used wisdom sayings, wisdom type sayings frequently. I just wanted to show you some examples uh, in chapter 12 of Luke, verse 15. And this, this is an example of a, a wisdom type saying. He said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundant in the abundance of his possessions. That is really a, a wisdom type saying. One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Simple statement of truth, brief, memorable, that kind of thing. And then a little bit later in that same chapter, verse 34, Jesus says, and this may be a more familiar saying to, to you, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, a short, compact, sort of two-part saying with a picture in it, a treasure. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus often taught in wisdom language. A couple other examples, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 14. Jesus says, if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. See how that's similar to the kind of thing you would read in the middle of Proverbs. Uh, it's sort of a, uh, a picture. We would almost, you know, today we would make a video to express that. Jesus did it with just words, wonderful words. If the blind lead the blind, we can all see that sort of ridiculous picture. But if that were to happen, they both fall into the ditch, into a pit. And he's using it there to talk about uh, the, the Jewish religious teachers of the day who were blind guides. Who were they able to teach and influence? Um, you know, how can one blind person lead another? That's an example of one of these. And, and one other, John chapter 12, just to show you how he does this throughout the Gospels. 12, verse 24 of John, the Lord says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And of course, he's doing all kinds of things with that teaching, but he's sort of using a wisdom type saying to express it, painting a picture it's memorable and, and has a lot of weight to it uh, when it's examined. Now, elsewhere in the New Testament, outside of the Gospels, we know that Jesus is, is consistently described as the wisdom of God, uh, the wisdom of God toward us. For example, Colossians, in Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 2, verse 3, uh, he, he says um, at the end of verse 2, talking of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, in, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Remember, in Proverbs, wisdom and knowledge are always in parallel with one another. They basically mean the same thing. One explains the other. And all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ, according to Paul. And finally, in the first chapter of the first Corinthian letter, probably a pretty familiar passage for you here. Verse 24 is, uh, remember, um, Paul had been talking about how he, he, he uses the term we, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But then in verse 24, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Uh, Paul refers to Jesus as the wisdom of God. And then in verse 30 of the same reading there, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So we can make a list of other texts, but Jesus is consistently 
described as the wisdom of God in, in the New Testament and claimed it for himself, said he was wiser than Solomon. Uh, so uh, wisdom is not just an Old Testament thing. Um, it's, it's, it's a New Testament and it's a big part of Jesus' teaching. The, 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 uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, the beginning of Matthew 5 are wisdom sayings. And a lot of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' great sermon, are wisdom type sayings. And so uh, when we study the Proverbs, it, it prepares us for Jesus' teaching as well. So I hope, hope uh, our look in Proverbs has been a benefit to you. We, we left a lot unsaid a lot unread in in the book, but that's uh, by design. And uh, again, Proverbs is one of those books where you can open up randomly and find a proverb, you know, stick your finger on a page and read that one and, and meditate and reflect on that one and really benefit from it. You can't do that with most of Scripture. Context is so important. And sometimes even in Proverbs. But Proverbs is one of those books where... Uh, Verse after verse, they're sort of self-contained units of wisdom. And uh, remember the basic atti attitude of the book is very uh, optimistic, that, that wisdom and truth can be expressed and understood. And, uh, and, and that's, that's what we expect to see when we read Proverbs. The next book uh, is not optimistic in the same way. The book of Ecclesiastes is of a different character. It's in fact pessimistic. Is there room for pessimism in, in biblical faith? Well, uh, I think you'll see there's something there for us in the book of Ecclesiastes. So that's where we'll plan to open up next time. I have sort of a different view of Ecclesiastes, I'll warn you. So if you don't want a different view, maybe don't turn in, uh, tune in next week. But I think it's a very helpful view. It's helped me to appreciate that strange book uh, of Ecclesiastes. It is part of the wisdom literature. I think it is important. And I think it's definitely the word of God to us. Thanks for being a part of our study tonight. Hope it's a blessing to you. May God bless you this week. week and uh, hope he's growing you and keeping you safe spiritually, uh, but also physically. And that you're being a blessing to others. Have a great night.